Hi everyone, my name is Don Lyons. I'm with the Trinity College Dublin School of Law and really happy to be talking to Professor Peter Singer today. So Professor Singer is Ira W. DeCamp Professor of Bioethics in the University Centre for Human Values at Princeton University, as well as a Laureate Professor at the University of Melbourne. Um, it's nine o'clock in Melbourne where uh, Professor Singer is tuning in, so we're really grateful we were able to get the time zones uh, coordinated on this. Peter Sanger was made a Companion of the Order of Australia in 2012, as well as being Founder and Board Chair of The Life You Can Save, which is a non-profit that fights extreme poverty. Peter is very influential um, and very well respected in the Trinity academic community and beyond. This book that we're talking about today is called Why Vegan? It's launched today, the 24th of September in, the, in Ireland and the UK with Penguin Great Ideas and it will be launched in October in the US with Norton. Um, Peter is one of the great moral philosophers of the modern age and in this book you ask unflinching questions about how we should live our lives. The ideas collected in these writings arguing that human ty tyranny over animals is wrong comparable to racism and sexism has triggered the animal rights movement and has given impetus to a rise in vegan eating in the modern world. Um, so just to say that the format today is I'll ask a few questions to give P Peter an opportunity to present an overview of the book um, and then it will be open for questions and you're free to enter your questions into the Q&A text box there at the bottom. And we do have to finish up uh, after one hour. So I just wanted to start off by reading a short quote from the first essay, which is the preface to the 1975 edition of Animal Liberation. And on page one, you say that this book, referring to the original Animal Liberation book, um, so this book is about the tyranny of human over non-human animals. This tyranny has caused um, and today is still causing an amount of pain and suffering that can only be compared with that which resulted from the centuries of tyranny by white humans over black humans. The struggle against this tyranny is a struggle as important as many, any of the moral and social issues that have been fought over in recent years. And then on page six, a liberation movement demands an expansion of our moral horizons. Practices that were previously regarded as natural and inevitable come to be seen as the result of an unjustifiable prejudice. Who can say with any confidence that none of his or her attitudes and practices can legitimately be questioned? If we wish to avoid being numbered among the oppressors, we must be prepared to rethink all our attitudes to other groups, including the most fundamental of them. We need to consider our attitudes from the point of view of those who suffer by them and by the practices that follow from them. If we can make this unaccustomed mental switch, we may discover a pattern in our attitudes and practices that operate so as consistently to benefit the same group, usually the group to which we ourselves belong, at the expense of another group. So we come to see that there is a case for a new liberation movement. The aim of this book is to lead you to make this mental switch in your attitudes and practices towards a very large group of beings, members of species other than our own. I believe that our present attitudes to these beings are based on a long history of prejudice and arbitrary discrimination. I argue that there can be no reason except the selfish desire to preserve the privileges of the exploited group for refusing to extend the basic principle of equality of consideration to members of other species. I ask you to recognize that your attitudes to members of other species are a form of prejudice, no less objectionable than prejudice about a person's race or sex. So that's uh, an extract from the preface to the 1975 edition of Animal Liberation. And in the second essay, you provide an overview of Animal Liberation, which is the keystone text, which led to a um, huge movement in favor of animal liberation. I was wondering if you would like to give us an overview of, of that foundational text. Right, well, I think you, you read a key passage from it just then. Um, the the book uh, to give an overview the, the book has uh, an opening chapter which is the moral argument uh, essentially elaborating on what you've read um, the argument is that to draw the boundaries of our moral concern at the boundary of species is not justifiable and that just as in the past we drew this boundary more narrowly we drew it for example about essentially around whites regarding uh, blacks, people of African descent as inferior and even as someone who could be enslaved. Uh, and we now recognize that as greatly as, as a terrible wrong. Um, so, you know, we should not think that we have necessarily eliminated biases and prejudices against other beings 
even if we do get to the point of saying all humans have basic rights, because there are other sentient beings on this planet, that is other beings who can feel pain or whose lives can go well or badly for them. And uh, it's a prejudice to think that their interests don't matter or, or matter much less than ours do when they're similar interests. So the first chapter argues for the principle of equal consideration of similar interests. That's that's the key principle that pain, for example, is just as bad, whether experienced by a human or a non-human animal, if we're talking about similar amounts, similar intensities of pain. Uh, and uh, after making that argument in the first chapter, I then describe some ways in which we do not give anything remotely like equal consideration of similar interests to non-human animals. So there's a long chapter on the use of animals in research, uh, experimentation on animals, and there's a long chapter on uh, factory farming, on uh, intensive farming, and, and what these things do to animals. Um, I then talk about what we eat, the importance of being a vegetarian. Uh, this is 1975, so I wasn't thinking about being vegan then. Um, and then I go on and give a history of the ideas, the different species ideas, particularly in the West, uh, which have formed our thinking about animals today. And in the last chapter of Animal Liberation, I discuss some uh, objections to the argument. I try and preempt certain objections. Thank you so much for that. Um, and that leads me into the next question, which is your views have developed over time. So in 1973, you would have advocated for vegetarianism. And this book is called Why, Why, Why Vegan? So over that period of time, um, you've advocated from vegetarianism to veganism. I'm just wondering how and why that came about. Okay. So uh, firstly, let me say that because my ethics is um, the underlying ethical view that I have is uh, utilitarian, that is it is based on trying to promote good consequences. Um, so I do advocate being a vegan in general, but I'm not uh, sort of really strict about that. It's not for me something like, um, you know, a religious dietary preference where you feel you absolutely have to follow uh, particular uh, dietary rules. It's a matter of trying to minimize the harmful effects that you have. So um, uh, in that way, I'm, 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 you know, and I say this in the, 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 uh, the American book, the book that Norton is pointing out, has a preface uh, that I've you know, written for the book. Penguin didn't want that preface because for Penguin, it's part of this series of great ideas, most of uh, the authors of whom are dead. So they couldn't write the prefaces, obviously. Um, and I was sort of stuck with that format. But in the, uh, in the, in the American preface, I say that despite writing this book, um, you know, in, in one sense, I'm not a vegan. Um, so, you know, some examples of this, uh, if an animal is not capable of feeling pain, I don't mind eating it. And I think that might be the case for oysters and clams and mussels and so on. I think their, their nervous system is so rudimentary that it seems unlikely to me that they can experience pain. Um, secondly, uh, one of the essays in the book later on is about uh, producing uh, cultured meat, meat at the cellular level, which would not involve an animal. I'd be quite happy to eat that if it were available. Um, so I guess if you eat meat of any kind, you're not strictly a vegan. Uh, and thirdly, um, and this gets closer to your answer, um, I still don't see a lot wrong with eating uh, eggs from genuinely free range hens able to you know, range around in a field and grass outside. I think they have reasonable lives of all the animals reared for farm purposes. They probably have the best lives. Uh, and uh, although it's true, unfortunately, that they don't live out their full life, um, because once their rate at which they lay eggs starts to drop off, farmers will, will send them to be slaughtered. Um, and also the males of the egg laying breeds are slaughtered uh, immediately on hatching. So there are things that you can object to, but you know, in terms of the balance of consequences, uh, there are some hens living good lives and maybe that's okay, that's a borderline thing. Um, but the other, the bigger difference between my views now and my views when I wrote Animal Liberation is that I've come to see the dairy industry as pretty well 
necessarily inflicting uh, wrongful suffering on, on cows. And that's because to produce milk, at least at a commercial, on a commercial scale, um, you need to make the cows pregnant every year, roughly. And then you need to take the calves away from them. If you leave the calves with them, of course, the calves will drink a lot of the milk and commercial dairy farmers don't want that. So um, uh, cows are mammals. The, the bond between uh, a cow and her calf is, is very strong. And uh, any honest dairy farmer will tell you that when you take the calf away from the cow, both the calf and the cow are suffering from that. And, and for quite a long time, uh, uh, farmers have reported that uh, cows may call out for their calf um, for days, weeks, um, even a, a month or so after the calf is taken away. So, so I think that's not defensible. Um, I have heard of one dairy farm here in, in Australia that leaves the cows with the mothers. I think the milk costs three or four times as much as, as other milk. So it's probably not going to catch on on a wide scale. You know, maybe you could argue that that's okay, but um, yeah. essentially that's not the dairy industry as it exists worldwide today. Yeah, thanks. And you did just mention uh, cultured meats there. And so something I was going to ask was towards the end of the book, you have a couple of essays on more recent views and the second last essay as a 2018 piece on cultured meat. I was wondering if you'd like to expand on the ideas in that, and I suppose comparing that to what you were just saying about dairy that's more expensive, to, to what extent do you think cultured meat can take on, can become profitable in, in comparison to standard factory farmed meat? Uh, right, so I'm hopeful that cultured meat will become economically competitive with standard meat. I think we may first see that in terms of replacing things like um, uh, like mincemeat, hamburger meat. Um, I think that's going to be the easier thing to do rather than to produce a, a steak, for instance, which will require a different texture. That, that may come, but it'll be longer. Um, and the reason that I think it, it in principle should be competitive is that after all, it's avoiding a lot of waste. It's avoiding um, producing the parts of the animal that we don't eat. Uh, and you know, some of which get thrown out, some of which get turned into fertilizer or something like that, like the bones, but still um, it's not a high value product. And in this way, we're um, just producing the, the, the parts that we eat. So uh, if we can solve some of the technical problems, then it may well be producing an equivalent to meat um, at a lower price. And I think that would be a very good thing because then we would start to replace uh, a lot of the meat we're eating. And people are working on this uh, not only for like hamburger beef, but uh, also for chicken uh, and for fish. Uh, so I think if this can succeed, the reduction in animal suffering will be great. And incidentally, um, the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions will be very great as well. Um, particularly for those animals like uh, cows and sheep, which have very high greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, that would be, on some estimate I've seen, it would be only 3% uh, of the emissions of the uh, whole animals. Thank you so much. Um, and Dr. Surya Roy is here and is going to ask about the environmental side of things in a minute. So I'll leave that to him. But um, there is a second an essay or sorry the final essay which is the second new piece of yours I think and it's written this year with Paola Cavalieri about COVID-19 the two dark sides of COVID-19 and you talk there about wet markets and the regulation of wet markets as a means of well to reduce animal suffering but then also potentially to to stop the spread of viruses like COVID-19 would you like to expand on the ideas in that essay? Yes, thank you. Um, so uh, going back to the, you know, where I came from, I, I got into this issue because of my concern about animal suffering. Um, sometime in the 80s, I started learning about climate change and um, soon after that about the contribution that animal agriculture makes to climate change. It's somewhat controversial how great that contribution is, but it's, it's significant. On some estimates, it's second after um, stationary power generation. Um, uh, and now I think there's a third reason that we're discovering, and that is uh, the pandemics. Now, 
in the case of what we, what Paolo Cavalieri and I wrote about um, uh, regarding the current uh, coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic, that seems to have come from wild animals um, through the wet market in Wuhan. Uh, a wet market, for those not familiar with the term, is a market in which live animals are available for sale, but not as pets or companion animals, but rather the customer points to the animal in the cage and the animal is then slaughtered on the spot. So there's blood and gore around. It's, uh, and of course there's feces around as well because uh, the animal is in a cage. Uh, there are many different species. Uh, it's thought probably that in uh, Wuhan, it was uh, pangolins who are a sort of delicacy in, in China that carried the virus, it has been shown they do. Uh, bats also carry the virus and bats are also consumed. So we don't exactly know, but it seems to have come from some of these wild animals uh, and then got into humans through that. So uh, we, are, we are arguing strongly for a ban on wet markets, both because they are horrendous for animals and because they uh, are a source of pandemic risk and, um, if they're allowed to continue, then we will no doubt in coming years get other diseases. But I do want to emphasize that the pandemic risk isn't only about wet markets, it's also about factory farming. And uh, the previous uh, global pandemic declared by the World Health Organization was the swine flu pandemic in 2009. Now, a lot of people say, hey, well, I don't remember that. It wasn't a big deal like this one. Mm -hmm. um, no, it wasn't, but that's because well, at least it wasn't for us in the West, that's mostly because most of the deaths were not in Western countries. Um, mm. But there were something like half a million deaths on some estimates anyway, between 150,000 and half a million. So it was significant. And it came out of a intensive pig farm, um, uh, probably in North Carolina. So uh, that's another health risk that we're going to, you know, and, and scientists have said, if you wanted to create new viruses, what would you do? You'd get thousands of animals, crowd them together in a single building uh, and put them under stress so that their immune systems are weakened. And that's an ideal environment for viruses to mutate and spread. And then humans then handle these animals uh, and they get into humans. So, you know, that is what factory farms do, not in order to produce viruses, but uh, in order to produce cheap meat and uh, I, there is a real risk that we'll get another pandemic that way. And now that we know how enormous the cost of pandemics are, and we could easily get one that is even worse than this, that is, has a higher rate of fatalities per infectious, uh, per infectious cases. So I think it's, it's also a strong reason for getting rid of factory farming. Absolutely. I'm going to bring Kianich Khan in on this. So Kianich was a scholar in uh, philosophy in Trinity College Dublin and has completed a master's in law doing a dissertation in the area of animal rights and will be pursuing a PhD in that area in the coming years. So Pianich, uh, we can hear you now if you'd like to go ahead and ask a question. Okay, great. Um, sorry, is my mic working? Yes. Okay, yes, great. Um, okay, great. I have um, two questions for you, Peter. Um, it's great to be able to ask them. Um, but the first is to do with animal rights. So, yeah, people say animal rights all the time, but usually it's just a shorthand for talking about animal protection in a broader sense. But um, I'm actually wondering where you stand on the literal idea of human rights and like if you, be or of animal rights, sorry, and if you believe that the human rights framework is suitable to be extended to animals, or do you think, as many have argued already, that transposing human rights to animals is anthropocentric in itself? Yes, well, as I, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm a utilitarian in the foundations of my ethics. Um, and utilitarians don't think that rights are the starting point or the foundation of ethics. Uh, some people do, you know, some people say, well, we have these natural rights or these God-given rights like the US Declaration of Independence. Um, and that's what you start uh, your ethical view or your political or social view from. For me, Rights are uh, conventions, um, which may be put into law, um, which are justified when they produce uh, a better society in the case of human rights. Um, and so I think we can defend a lot of human rights by saying uh, you know, people need security in what they do. They need to, be, uh, to know that they will be protected in their 
freedom of speech and association and uh, religion and a variety of, of other rights that people have. So that's why we have them. And then uh, you can put the same arguments in regard to animals that uh, we could recognize a list of animal rights of things that we should not do to animals. So in, in one work that I uh, uh, co-edited um, also with Paola Cavalieri, the Italian animal activist and, and scholar that I wrote the article on pandemics with, uh, we, we did a project called the Great Ape Project, which was an edited book. And we started that out with a declaration of rights for great apes. Uh, to sort of make the point that uh, great apes are beings who are entitled, for example, not to be enslaved, um, as in fact many of them, uh, many of them are those in, in captivity or being used for research, uh, which fortunately is a little less now than it was when the book came out, but still still is happening in some places. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, I'm prepared to talk about the rights in that sense for animals. Uh, I, I usually don't talk a lot about animal rights because I think people tend to misunderstand that and to think that I'm just saying intuitively, you know, animals have these rights as if they're natural rights. So I more often talk about uh, equal consideration as I did earlier, uh, consideration for their interests. But if you wanted to say animals have a right to have their interests considered with the same weight as humans, I'm perfectly happy to, to say that. Yeah, okay, great. Thanks. That makes sense. Thanks. Um, I hope that explains. Yes, it does. Thank you. Um, my second question is now to do with um, animal welfare legislation. Um, I know you're advocating for veganism, but many people obviously support better welfare for farm animals as well as that, you know, since it's unlikely that industrial farming is going to be abolished overnight. Um, but I'm wondering if you believe that animal welfare legislation is something we should support or invest energy in, or do you think, like a lot of people have argued, that in a lot of cases it actually just regulates harm and in some cases even increases it. Um, like, do you think that maybe animal welfare legislation potentially does more harm than good? No, I don't think that. Um, obviously, if it is the case that animal, a particular piece of animal welfare legislation is doing more harm than good, we, we shouldn't have it. But um, I completely accept what you said at one point that uh, factory farms are not gonna be abolished overnight. Um, it's gonna be a long and slow process. And in the meantime, if we can reduce the suffering of animals, I think that's a good thing to do. I, th I think that uh, when people oppose this and some people have opposed it on the grounds that uh, we, should, we should be arguing for the abolition of uh, all commercial and exploitative uses of animals, which, which is the ideal. But I think they're consigning animals to more suffering for an indefinite period. So, so just to give you one example, in 2008, the year that President Obama was, was elected, there was also a referendum in California to give uh, farm animals more space, to enable them to move around, to get uh, laying hens out of the small cages where they couldn't even fully stretch their wings, to enable veal calves and uh, pigs to be able to turn around rather than be in individual stalls too narrow for them to turn around. And some people opposed that, uh, saying, uh, as I mentioned, that you know, we don't want animals in commercial farms at all. Um, but fortunately, that referendum passed. And as a result of that, for the past 12 years, there has been, I believe, significantly less suffering by animals in those categories that would have been in those systems in California. Um, and it's spread to some other states of the US. And of course, the European Union also has legislation prohibiting uh, those practices that I just mentioned. So we're talking about many hundreds of millions of more animals there that would be suffering each year without that legislation. So I don't think that, you know, if I knew that we would abolish all this within the next five years, you know, maybe I wouldn't be supporting this legislation, but we don't know when that's going to happen. And I think we have to work incrementally and anything that helps animals in the meantime, I think is worth achieving. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you for that answer. I mean, I guess my concern is that it would encourage complacency amongst people. Um, and then, yeah, we think that. I don't, I don't see that, right? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, as I said, that referendum in California came in in 2008. The vegan movement in California, as elsewhere, has actually grown enormously in that time. It's not as if people said, oh, well, now, you know, animals can turn around in their factory farm stalls. Uh, 
and therefore we needn't bother about it. Um, we, we've actually had a huge growth in, in precisely those places and also in Europe where, where conditions are better. We haven't had more complacency. We've had more people actually shifting to um, a vegan diet. So I think that shows that that isn't happening. Yeah, sure, that makes sense. Um, great, thank you so much for answering my questions. Thank you, Kiamit. And it gets the discussion going, I suppose, which is uh, good publicity for the, the movement itself. Um, Professor Surya Roy is with us today as well. So I'm gonna promote you to a panelist, Surya, and to remind everyone that you can ask questions in the Q&A text box at the bottom if you do have a question. But Surya is um, an assistant professor here at the Trinity College Dublin School of Law with significant expertise in environmental law and regulation and um, has a couple of questions for you, if that's okay. Hi, Surya. Hi, Donna. Hi, Donna. And, and hi, Peter. It's, it's a starstruck moment for me, really it is. Um, <laughs> you see, you. I Thank teach you. environmental law at Trinity and I always wonder how to be a good consequentialist, which is, which is difficult in a law school, let me assure you. So I have always looked to your work for um, inspiration. Um, so I do have 4,000 questions, but if I can ask three of them, that uh, that will be that will be great, I think. Um, so one is I want to pick up, up where Donna left off on the issue of climate change, which you mentioned in your book. And what I was wondering is that if you do consider climate change to be a factor when you're making an argument for being vegan or vegetarian, then I'm just wondering, shouldn't we also consider other consequences such as the economic effects on the meat and dairy industries when we talk about dietary choices. So I'm just wondering, will it not be simpler and better to just concentrate on animal suffering as the sole consequence when we are considering our dietary choices rather than extraneous factors such as climate change? Well, uh... I can see that the, the animal concern, the concern about animal suffering is, is definitely one major concern. And as I said, it's what originally got me to think about what I was eating. Um, but, but now I think we can't escape the contribution that uh, the meat industry makes to climate, the meat and dairy industry, I should say, makes to climate change. So if we're considering in general, the topic of the ethics of what we eat, which is the title of a book I wrote together with Jim Mason back in 2005, then I don't think we can ignore things like uh, climate change, just as I don't think we sh should ignore uh, pol uh, water pollution, which is a major problem in some factory farm areas. Uh, uh, all of those issues, I think, come into consideration. Uh, and I think they're, they're relevant also if we're talking about whether we should be vegan or vegetarian, because one, one argument is that uh, some animals do have good lives. I, I mentioned free range hens earlier, but the other uh, argument is for grass fed beef. So I think when, when cattle are out on grass, um, they can have good lives. That's a reasonably natural life for them. It's what they're adapted to. Uh, the calves stay with the mothers um, uh, and, and uh, you know, sure they, of course they get trucked away for slaughter, but um, their lives on grass, uh, while they're living, a, it's not really bad. It, again, it will depend on the circumstances. Are they going to get branded with a hot iron? You know, do they get castrated with that anesthetic? Do they get dehorned? Uh, also a painful procedure. So there are certainly some things you can object to. But one of the big things about grass-fed cattle is uh, the emission of greenhouse gases, of methane in particular, which happens to be even worse than uh, grain-fed cattle, even worse than feedlot cattle, you know, because it takes them longer to reach uh, market weight. And so they have to have more digesting to do and there's more methane produced per kilo of beef. Um, so I think, you know, if we really want to have arguments that address all of these issues, the arguments based on climate change are relevant. Thanks, Thanks Peter. The, the, the next one, you know, it's, it's more personal and I personally have a very strange ambivalent relationship with meat. And, and I want to give you a few anecdotes and maybe um, ask you what I have in mind, you know, that, you know, it, it started with, I don't know if you know, but the current Indian government, they, they incite the lynching of Muslims, and especially when they find them eating beef. And mm -hmm. 
what I found is I'm not a regular beef eater myself, but when that happened, you know, out of solidarity, I went and bought an enormous steak and ate it that evening, you know, when these lynchings started. Um, a, a couple of other anecdotes, you know, it's the second is, you know, I feel equally bad when I waste both rice and meat. Now, the fact that I, when I waste meat, I know why it's bad. But the reason I feel bad when I waste rice is because my grandmother told me that's a waste, not food. You know, that's, that's what it was. Um, the third is, you know, I've noticed that McDonald's is a, is a status food in some countries, and it's not in some other countries, you know. And the final anecdote is that there is now research to show that when you're in an intimate relationship, that has a profound effect on a change in your diet rather than other relationships. So where am I going with all this? But where I'm going with these anecdotes is, like, don't you think dietary preferences are conditioned by social and relational factors that are different from our preferences regarding, say, the brand of soap or shampoo that we use? Well, there's a lot of interesting things there. Um, in, in terms of wasting food, uh, I try not to waste food in general because obviously it takes energy to produce any food and to transport the food to somewhere where I can get it. I do grow some of my own vegetables, um, so I guess there's no transport there. Uh, but um, then you don't like to waste what you've put effort into growing, of course. So um, I think it's better, you know, I have a general view about not, not wasting food. Um, but, you know, let me come to the, the last point that you made about uh, diet being a, a social and cultural preference. To some extent, undoubtedly it is. Uh, and yes, there are many cultures which have particularly, you know, dietary rules, um, Orthodox Jews, Muslims, Hindus, uh, uh, others have particular dietary rules. Uh, I'm not religious myself, and so I don't follow any of those rules. If people want to follow them, okay. Um, although if they're then doing harm, I think that there is a problem. And so, for example, I think there's a problem with the idea that uh, religion requires you to slaughter animals in ways that are not the best and most humane ways available today with the technology we have. But um, I don't think the dietary preference is only social and cultural. Um, and actually, I just took part in some research which got published this year, um, showing that philosophy classes can have an effect on diet. This is actually the first controlled non-laboratory study to have shown that a philosophy class has uh, an impact on behavior at all, let alone on diet. And, and we did this by uh, getting some very large classes and uh, more or less randomly uh, giving half the class uh, a class on the ethics of eating meat and the other half uh, a different class on the ethics of donating to charity. And we were then able to obtain data because most of the students at this university uh, buy food at a university cafeteria where they use their ID card. So we were able with, you know, with anonymity, not knowing the identity of the students, but uh, putting the card numbers together, we were able to show that students in the meat class uh, ordered fewer meat products at the cafeteria than students in the charity class. Uh, so that's, that's a result that suggests that philosophical argument does make some difference. It's not all uh, the culture or the society that you're in. And I find that encouraging. You know, I, hope, I hope we can increase the impact that it makes. That's, no, but that's amazing. I'm going to look up this research myself because I know you're your debate with Judge Posner, for instance, when he said um, philosophy follows moral choices rather than come before uh, moral choices. But, you know, this research sort yeah. of, I think, is a... I, th I think we've shown that that's not true. Yeah, if you want yeah. to look at it and other people, um, it's, uh, I did it with two co-authors, uh, Eric Schwitzgabel, who's really, there was the lead author, and Brad Coakelet, and it was published uh, in a journal called Cognition, um, uh, which is one of the leading psychology journals. Uh, and it's was just published maybe uh, two months ago, something like that. Too late okay. to get into the book in any way. Oh, but, no, no, totally, uh, totally. Still good. Um, yeah. And you know, I have, I have one last question and I promise I'll stop after that, which is, and it follows from this um, on, on the nature of philosophy, because one of the areas I work on is on the expressive function of law, where some laws have a change on behavior and some laws don't. 
and you know there is some complexity to that and i wonder you know in your books and it started with animal liberation you are equally interested in communicating the nature of animal suffering as well as the fact of animal suffering so i'm just wondering whether this is a new way of doing philosophy where it's not only a detached exposition of principles but one where um you're sort of interested more in in exposure and one you're interested more in almost letting the reader feel her way into philosophy and i know you know that you you took the author jm kadzia to task a little bit on using a detached narrative voice um where you didn't know what his philosophical position really was but i'm just wondering whether in your philosophy it's also a little bit different from a detached ontological exposition of principles but um, a way whereby you sort of do it in a way where you get the reader to feel her way into the principles and positions that you have yes uh, you're 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 right in characterizing uh, certainly what i was doing in animal liberation and what i've done in some of my other work for example in the book uh, the life you can save um which is about global poverty uh and i suppose it is somewhat different from the way philosophy has been done relatively recently um but it it also is returning to a philosophical tradition um you can look at some say john stuart mill would be a philosopher you could look at in the middle of the 19th century who certainly tried to get people to see uh some of the unnecessary suffering that he as a utilitarian was was trying to prevent um Jeremy Bentham also wrote about prison reform for instance um and and Mill I should mention wrote a, an excellent book on the subjection of women in which I think he's also trying to get people to see how bad it is for women to be um completely under the domination of men so uh I think I'm you know I'm I'm not the uh the only philosopher by a long way to do this but but there was a period in the uh 20th century perhaps when this became something that was not acceptable when leading philosophers including AJ Eyre who was still a professor of philosophy when I was a graduate student at Oxford was saying you know this is not the business of philosophers this is this is for the preacher um uh, but I I I don't feel that I'm a preacher as I already said I'm not religious but I also feel yeah I'm I'm trying to produce arguments but to see the impact of the arguments on practical issues like the treatment of animals or like global poverty or like um uh assist physician assistance in dying for people who are terminally ill and suffering it is important to get people to realize what the cost of our present uh ways of acting and and our present laws in some of these cases actually is and to do that i think you do have to make people feel what's what's wrong what's going on um you know and i try try to be reasonably objective in in what i'm doing uh, as as far as i can so for example in animal liberation most of my descriptions of the animal research that was being done were taken from the journals and were written i was quoting from the articles written by the people who did the experiments and wrote them up in the journals uh, i was trying to avoid imposing my own sort of uh, particular ethical subjective uh, attitudes to this research thanks very much peter thanks good thank you yeah and i can see that in this book as well you don't reach for exaggerations it does seem to be a very factual exposition of the issues that you're detailing thank you sir yeah so i'm going to bring professor andrea mulligan in to this so professor mulligan is also an assistant professor at the trinity college dublin school of law with expertise uh, amongst other areas in bioethics uh, as well as being a practicing barrister would you like to come in on that andrea hello thanks donna good afternoon professor singer it's a real delight uh, to get to talk to you and um, so as donna said uh, my research and teaching is in the field of medical law and ethics and law and bioethics and um, so i guess i'm very interested in ideas of personhood um, and that's where i've looked at your work a lot um and i suppose one aspect of your work on animals that really fascinates me um is the fact that you say that you're not particularly fond of animals um and that in your in the preface to animal liberation you say you're not really you know you don't have pets you're not really into animals 
Um, and I think your concern for them is purely rational rather than emotional, we might say. So, and I find that really, really interesting. And I suppose my questions for you are, I guess, first of all, on a personal level, like, has that ever changed? You know, have you ever met an animal that changed your mind about that? Um, and secondly, in terms of sort of bringing people around the movement, um, I think for a lot of people, what, what brings them around to thinking about animal welfare is personal relationships with animals, you know, is knowing an animal and seeing their, their sort of, their feelings, seeing their pain, their suffering perhaps. So I'm curious as to whether or not you think that that's a, an effective way of bringing people around the movement uh, and whether you kind of tolerate that even if you don't find it yourself. Um, or whether you think that it's really the rational arguments that really have to be emphasized uh, in terms of convincing people uh, of the importance of this. I, I, I recognize that, you know, there are all kinds of people and they're different, different things move different people. And you're certainly right that many people, including people who've become involved in the animal movement and played an important role in making progress for animals have come into it because they've had a companion animal and they've cared for that animal. And uh, then they've made the connection between that animal and other animals. Um, one of the greatest uh, strategists uh, for animals in, that I've ever known was a man called Henry Spira, who uh, I got to know in New York in the 1970s when I was actually writing Animal Liberation. Uh, and he's someone who'd uh, spent his whole life fighting for the oppressed and, and underprivileged for, you know, March for Civil Rights in the American South, um, worked for a uh, reform group in, a, in the Merchant Seamen's Union. He was a merchant seaman for some time, taught in, in schools that were predominantly minority pupils and so on. Um, and he'd never really thought about animals as being oppressed and underprivileged. And some friend who was going overseas uh, said, look, I need somebody to take care of my cat. Here's my cat look after it. Um, and, and he started to really, you know, care for this cat and would pet the cat and spend time with it. Um, and then one time he suddenly realized that he was, uh, you know, patting one animal and sticking a knife and fork into another. Um, and that, uh, actually combined with something he read about animal liberation, um, and, and he made him pick up the book. And so it was, for him, it was a combination of those two things, I think, and maybe they were both necessary to make him spend uh, most of the rest of his life working for animals and working very effectively for animals. Um, so yeah, I welcome that. I, I don't oppose people having companion animals if they can look after them well and, and treat them with respect and concern for their interests. Um, but I'm personally, although you know, we have had pets in our family because I've had children and the children when they were small, um, have had uh, have had pets. We had a stray cat that a friend picked up and said, "Can we look after?" And we did that for some years. We've also had ex-laboratory rats who make um, very cute little companion animals. I think. Um, so uh, I've got nothing against that. But I, I think, you know, personally, um, my contribution as a philosopher is to make the rational arguments, um, and so that's what I'm trying to do in Animal Liberation and in this book, Why Vegan as well. Um, but I recognize, as, as you said, that uh, for many people, it's important to have a personal connection with an animal to understand exactly how animals are individuals, how they each have personalities, and how their lives can go well or badly, depending on the conditions under which they're living. Thanks very much. I'm intrigued to hear about the pet lab rats, which sounds like a, an exciting new pet project some of us might engage in. Thanks very much. <laughs> right. Thanks, Andrea. Would you like to ask any more questions or shall I move? I'll, I'll cede the floor. That was, those are launched Perfect. Thanks, Andrea. Thank you. Great. Um, I have uh, a, another student on the line, um, Sean, who is a former scholar of Trinity College Dublin, also in the area of philosophy, and is now, sorry, wait, technology. Yeah, are you, you're, you're there, Sean. So Sean is now doing a BPhil in Oxford uh, in the area with a specialization in animal rights, as far as I understand, um, and was very interested in coming today. Uh, he actually rescheduled the lecture he was to deliver. So very grateful you could be here, Sean, if you'd like to go ahead and I'll fix it on this issue. Yeah. Hi, Donna. Thanks, Peter. I appreciate you being here. Hi, so, good. It's always nice to hear from someone doing a BPhil because I did one of those at Oxford myself a long time ago. Uh, wasn't an opportunity to specialize in animal rights as part of the BPhil when I did it, though. <laughs> 
That's progress. Yeah, it's a progress of a kind. So uh, in your practical ethics, uh, you introduce many, at least you introduce me, uh, to the logic of the larder type arguments. That is arguments which take a concern for animals' welfare and decouple that argument or that concern from the practice of meat eating. So on this view, eating animals killed in so-called humane ways is better for animals since most of these animals wouldn't exist without that practice. Um, Jeff McMahon, uh, who's at Oxford now, and your former uh, supervisor, as I understand, Oram Hare, uh, also seem to make this point in his essay, Why I'm a Demi-Vegetarian. Yep. Um, so many have associated this sort of argument with your variety of utilitarianism, a hedonistic utilitarianism. So with this sort of, I wonder just what you think about this sort of argument, um, whether you think you know, it's worth considering, especially given the work of people like Derek Parfit and thinking about uh, population yeah. value and so on. So I wonder if you have any general thoughts on this. Yeah, it's definitely worth considering. Um, no question about that. And uh, you mentioned Derek Parfit, who I think of as you know, one of the, the greatest philosophers, perhaps the greatest philosopher that I've uh, known personally um, in the sense of, you know, really ability to think through new and complex problems. And uh, he's, you know, the, the logic of the larder um, is about specifically about animals. That phrase comes from the 19th century, early 20th century writer, uh, Henry Salt. Uh, and he was uh, dismissing the argument um, saying, you know, we, we shouldn't really talk about bringing animals into existence. We should, we only really should be thinking about animals who exist or, or will exist anyway, perhaps you could say, but uh, bringing an animal into existence in no way compensates for wronging the existing animal by killing that animal. Uh, but I think Parf had shown that that isn't nearly as simple a question as Salt thought it was. Um, and Hare also, of course, as you pointed out, made those kinds of arguments and Jeff McMahon also discusses them. There are a number of other philosophers. There's quite an extensive literature now of other people who are working in this area. So um, it's still, I think, um, something of an open question. That is, there are people who take the view that uh, if we can bring people into existence, people or animals into existence, that's a good thing to do if their lives will be positive. Um, and as you say, in the case of animals, if they'll be painlessly killed. Um, and others who think, no, um, ethics is really only about affecting persons who actually either are in existence or will come into existence irrespective of what we do. Uh, but there are, there are difficulties with both views. Um, I'm, I suppose, if anything, I do lean towards the view that there is value in bringing beings into existence who will have good lives. Um, and this is relevant, for example, for the discussion among effective altruists about reducing uh, risks of extinction. That, uh, for example, if something were to happen uh, that would cause everybody uh, on this planet to become extinct, that wouldn't only be the death of 7.8 billion people, bad as that would be, but it would also be even worse than that because it would prevent uh, vast numbers of future beings existing and if you think they're going to have good lives, then that would be a bad thing. So yes, I, I am prepared to apply this to, to animals, or at least I'm prepared to accept that if people do apply it to animals, there's a plausible argument for doing that. Um, and that does relate to questions about, do you have to be a vegan if you can get meat from animals who have had good lives and wouldn't have existed otherwise? And I would also now add, as we've been discussing, uh, you're not contributing to a significant contribution to climate change uh, and you're not contributing to a significant increased risk of pandemics. Um, but that's possible under, under specific conditions. I don't think that's going to be a uh, large scale commercial farming at all, but uh, it certainly is possible for some people living in you know, circumstances where they can make sure that that's where their meat comes from. So it's a serious argument. Yes, I'm not inclined to eat meat for that reason myself, but I don't claim to be able to clearly reject that argument for those who think that it's a justification for it. Thanks, Peter. Um, I hope that uh, clean meat and other technologies will get rid of the troubling effects of this argument. So we can sort of move that on. That would certainly be one way of doing it that would be 
Good old um, rat, yes. I just have one more question, if you don't mind. Please, uh, no, go ahead. So some have argued uh, since vast numbers of animals are killed in crop cultivation, we're talking small mammals, small birds, ground, ground dwelling birds in particular, uh, that a system of grass-fed cattle or some other grass-fed animal would be optimal uh, from the point of view of concern for animals. So not just about bringing animals into existence, but is actually causing more harm uh, to have massive crop cultivation. So I wonder what you think about this sort of argument, the empirical stuff aside, I wonder if you think um, that it is worth wronging individual animals in order to save more, because on the utilitarian view, uh, troubling though it is, it seems we'd have to be committed to it. Of course, there can be empirical doubts raised, perhaps. Yeah, um, I, I do think that there are empirical doubts. There, certainly, there was a mistake in the original argument that was put out, and I think it was pointed out by uh, another article by Gavrik Matheny and, and another co-author, uh, that uh, that was calculated on the base of number of animals killed per acre or hectare, but it didn't take account of the fact that you get a lot more food per acre or hectare when you grow crops than when you graze beef. So when you adjusted it for the amount of food you were getting, it turned out that there were actually fewer animals being killed uh, from the crop growing. So, but as you say, you know, that's an empirical question. And what happens if we just assume that the facts were as originally claimed, uh, then I think there would be a case on, on the animal related reasons, obviously not related to climate change, um, for saying that it's okay to eat the meat. Uh, I, I, you know, clearly, we, ha we have to live somehow. Um, of course, you, you might look for other options. You might say, well, other ways that we can grow the crops but kill fewer of these animals. Um, maybe, I don't know, make uh, an unpleasant noise that frightens them out of the wheat fields before you harvest the wheat, something of whatever. You know, if we really cared about animals, we would start to think about those sorts of ways of reducing animal suffering. Um, because we don't, you know, people, the farmers would laugh at you, I guess, if you say that, but, but we should be more concerned about animals being crushed by harvesters. Uh, and we probably could find ways to reduce that toll if, you know, we were, if, if we were sufficiently concerned about it. Uh, but, uh, you know, as I say, I accept that we have to eat, we have to find the ways of eating that uh, cause the least suffering, and it's an empirical question. Uh, what those are and and how we can go about doing it and and again going back to cultured meat that would certainly be one way of avoiding both of these uh costs both the climate change cost and, uh, and the cost to the to the cattle if we're growing cattle and the cost to the small mammals and birds caused through uh, losses during harvest thank you very much peter Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sean. Thank you, Peter. Is there anything else you wanted to bring into the discussion before we wrap up, Professor Singer? Uh, I'm happy that we've we've been able to have this discussion. I hope that uh, a lot of people who want to know more will look either at uh, the new book, uh, Why Vegan, and actually I, I have an advanced copy here, so I'll show you the, the cover of it. And it's a pretty slim book, as you can see, um, so you'll get through it pretty quickly, but it does contain the essentials of my views about uh, animals with some of that discussion of, of climate change. Um, for the fuller, fuller account, um, please read uh, Animal Liberation or the other book I mentioned with Jim Mason, The Ethics of What We Eat, which I think in the UK was published under the title Eating, um, probably in Ireland as well. Um, so, uh, but then there's a lot of other good things out there and uh, um, I, you know, do, do, do think about those issues and reach your own decision, of course, on what it is to live an ethical diet, which to eat an ethical diet, which I think is an important part of living an ethical life. Thank you so much. And you really are one of the great minds of our times and a philosopher who has had a truly immense impact on people's behaviours and daily choices um, with your vegetarian and vegan philosophies, as well as the life you can save movement. Um, you've really devoted so much of your life's work to speaking up on behalf of those without a voice. I think it's so admirable and I'm really grateful you could make it. I'm really grateful to all of the attendees who could be here as well. I think this will be a really widely read book and it's just been such an honour to discuss it with you today on the day of its release. So with that, I would finish the session. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. It's been a pleasure to talk to you and 
the audience. Take care.